Hello, my name is Adam Bean and welcome to the 75th edition of Ehex TV. And let's start with the content, content with the very first question. Okay, uh, I think it's Daniel Vamara, he is one of the alumni of uh, Ehex TV. He asked, the first question is already very good. So uh, the question is, um, yeah, he follows uh, the air hacks from the back of the class. As I remember, Daniel was actually uh, in the front of the class the last time or in the second or third row. This was my understanding, but let's go with the question. So it got the benefits and downsides of using Apache Kafka. So working in a microservice architecture, uh, one of my clients, so first, which is suspicious, is uh, what is actually a microservice architecture, right? So uh, uh, for me, it, um, if someone mentions microservice architecture, I always ask, you no, know, what do you mean by that? Is it like, you know, uh, multiple servers co or runtimes communicating with each other or one runtime is particularly uh, small or, or what, what, what's the deal? And one of my clients would like to integrate Kafka so that the services could write, produce data and other could read, consume data from the, from their, from there and process them. So from my perspective, this is already a wrong approach or wrong, suspicious approach. Why? Because um, so in Kafka world, you would have, let's call one microservice and the microservice would, would, wouldn't, uh, would not care at all about other microservices. It would just, you know, capture the state of the world and say, let's, um, okay, now uh, someone ordered a book and will put the book to the, Kafka topic, and this is basically it. Whether another service consumes uh, the the event or not, it does not actually matter. And um, and if you would like to communicate between microservices, so what it means is uh, one microservice already knows about the existence of another microservice and would like s send a message to the other microservice. I don't think uh, the Kafka is the best possible choice. It's like you know misusing Kafka for remote procedure calls. And I think REST would be a far better choice than this because um, let's say um, you would like to communicate with Kafka um, between microservices. The question is uh, how long should you know the messages live in the topic? Uh, because for communication, what it usually means is if the other service consumes the, uh, the event, it should disappear from the queue or topic. And in Kafka is more like a database and less like communication medium. So uh, just a side note, my client is moving from a monolithic service to a microservice, microservices, uh, one using Quarkus. That's why we would like to get some innovative technologies in the process. And about innovations, this is what I, in one, in one uh, workshop, we talk about JMS uh, and, and MQ series in this particular case. And my client uh, or my client, an architect told me uh, why I'm talking about JMS and uh, MQ series. We should, uh, this is an old legacy stuff we should focus you know, on, on Kafka instead. And uh, for me, it's just complete different use cases and, uh, and uh, even best practices. We mentioned it several times. So GMS is more about communications where the topics and cues are usually not persistent. And Kafka is more a database and less a communication medium where uh, the topics are usually always persistent or not usually. Topics are always persistent, and this is a feature, not a bug. So, next one. Uh, Mr. Six Days Ago, so after six days of thinking, he got the, the next question is, and the question is, uh, in uh, there's not a Jakarta ISTE rather than configuration about my recording setup, and this is a hard question because the rec my recording setup really varies what I'm doing. So my podcast setup, so Ahex FM, is completely different to this right now. So it's a different mic involved. It's something to do with the uh, technical setup because uh, I can record now the voice with screen sharing and in podcast, I only have the voice, so I need a different setup. And um, about the software, so I'm using Final Cut for editing. Um, it's called a motion for the titles. Then for streaming right now, I'm using a Wirecast. I, I use Wirecast for, I think, six or seven years. And my floating head here um, is uh, also a feature of uh, Wirecast, so the green screen. And behind me is actually a green screen. Um, and I optimize, I'm optimizing the uh, setup for seven years um, or even longer. I started, I think, 2012, the AirHacks TV. And before that, I was already did 
online uh, workshops for my clients or consulting, online consulting for my clients. So um, I use the um, and um, so uh, uh, three. So for screencasts, I do something different. For for AXTV, something different. And for video conferences, also completely different. So I have two two mics. So this is a condenser mic right now. And in and in my uh, um, consulting setup is a little bit different. So I have another mic. It's like more like uh, a, a a a single unit. And um, and yes, this is basically it. So um, and I'm optimizing all the time. So I have also um, HTML, uh, HDMI capturing hardware from uh, Black Magic is the company. And yeah, I'm optimizing it all the time. And if you ask me the same question in two months, you get probably different answer. And um, yeah, my mic goes to uh, to a um, how to call it and um, looks like a a preamp. Which connects to the uh, to my uh, to my machine, and this is a, a small Mac Mini, and uh, and the setup varies because the new one has USB-C and the old one had a Thunderbolt, so I have to kind of constantly rewire the older stuff, and yeah. So a hard question, but uh, yeah, uh, and I, I I spend a lot of time online uh, with my clients, online workshops, and what you see here at AXTV and YouTube is just a small portion of that. So this is why. I constantly try to optimize stuff. So the next one, and uh, I hope you are happy now. Um, so, and uh, I know from other screencasters and podcasters to use a complete different setup. And by the way, I think I started my very first screencasts on YouTube where with software called ScreenFlow, and there were some problems with it. So I, I switched to Wirecast then, and uh, yeah, I, I you know. I, I I had lots of problems with CPU, RAM, and and recording. So um, yeah, but now it works. Everything works fine. So I hope uh, the next uh, few times there will be you know consistent. I think about uh, buying a new camera because this one is pretty old already. And yeah, so this was like excursion to the hardware, which is uh, fairly boring. So the next one is interesting. And Mr. M. Zarhan uh, actually. Uh, how to call it? He uh, he he created some uh, problems on Twitter. So I got in shortest amount of time. Lots of you know, um, lots of um, questions regarding that. Let's see what is actually visible on Twitter. So there is a lots of uh, Mr. Suleiman Vuruku uh, said. Okay, why someone would think about migrating Jakarta to uh, to Spring and uh, what are the reasons? And there are lots of you no. Know, not firestorms, but there's a lot of discussion back and forth about reasons to uh, to migrate from from Spring to Jakarta, and uh, what you are doing, you are migrating from Spring and Angular JS to Jakarta Eon MicroProfile and Web Components at the same time. So this is interesting because um, I never did this at the same time. So what I did a few times, uh, migrating from Angular JS and Angular I.O., the new one, to Web Components. This is um, normal, I would say, um, in some projects uh, from, from other frameworks. But and uh, sometimes we had to migrate from, or had I was asked to help with the migration from Spring. And in, 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 in one possible, uh, one, one interesting case to, um, to uh, Jakarta uh, EE, and but never at the same time. So. Um, so there is a plan to migrate of uh, our enterprise product, which is interesting from Spring to Jakarta E. So and now it comes the interesting question. So first, I would really like to know what is your motivation of migrating Spring to Jakarta E? Because I couldn't answer this. I got lots of no, uh, not heat. Uh, it actually was productive and and, and positive, but uh, lots of discussion around Spring, and I couldn't contribute to the discussion because I have no idea what your motivation are. But the question is. My question is, is there MDN as Mozilla Developer Network as a compre comprehensive documentation for web development? Is there a such documentation for Java and Jakarta? E? And this is really funny because um, I saw, you know, MDN and I say, okay, now finally we have something comparable what we had for in Jakarta E or Java E, and I don't not sure about MicroProfile for years. So um now, what I did, I I, I, I I compiled a set of uh, interesting, of interesting, um, or hopefully useful uh, links. So uh, let's see. So first, there is the classic uh, Java Platform Enterprise Edition Java 8 uh, tutorial, and um, I I never read it completely. So just just portions. 
And there is some interesting uh, in information inside, but I would not take it too seriously. So is it some parts are over-engineered or just as, you know, you, you can look up technologies like, for instance, bin validation, and you will find hopefully interesting uh, examples and uh, which are really, really helpful. So um, let's see. So this was... was um, If we search for bin validation, you get the examples. So this is the part for bin validation. And then you get, you know, the first chapter is more like introduction, but you get, you know, here introduction to, to bin validation and using a bin validation constraints. And you get actually the examples. So this is the first one. And um and um and yeah, so let's close it. This was the Java 8 tutorial. Something uh similar, there is a, a tutorial about microprofile. And uh, Open Liberty from IBM, they are really, really, really nice. So you get something similar for, for MicroProfile where there's this compiled links to, let's say, configuring microservices. So you go here and you get guides about the configuration, which is, which is pretty good. And um, so what's the difference? This Mozilla Developer Network describes web platform, which is implemented in all browsers. What I'm talking about right here is like, you know, the backend platform, which is MicroProfile and Jakarta E API, which is uh, implemented by all runtimes. And all mean, all uh, runtimes I, I uh, know right now is like um, Open Liberty, Payara, partially Glassfish, um, then uh, Whitefly, Still, Thorntail is still um, then uh, I already probably mentioned Open Liberty and WebSphere Liberty, and Tommy, and uh, what else? Uh, Quarkus, Halidon, and um, yeah, and uh, let's see, Jakarta EE certified. So you get a list or of runtimes, but because there are some servers compatibility, and let's see the products and. Um, Ipusic, JUs, Tmax, uh, JBoss, of course, but this is a uh, Primeton app server. And uh, yeah, that's all. And uh, we are almost forgotten. BA WebLogic still comes with MicroProfile support and Jakarta 8 support. So, okay. So I think we have it. So we have then the Quarkus guides. And Quarkus is an interesting case because Quarkus supports MicroProfile. 90% of MicroProfile plus more, and uh, and the guides are great. So if you just you know focus on MicroProfile, Quarkus is also also nice. Then uh, there is a collection of guides for uh, for from Open Liberty, which usually addresses uh, MicroProfile and Jakarta E. And um, so the difference probably is you know everyone committed in the uh, in the web space to Mo Mozilla Developer Network like Google, Samsung. Uh, uh, Microsoft and Google said, uh, Google, I, th I think already mentioned, uh, Fire, uh, Mozilla, of course, said, uh, now we have a common place to share uh, you know, the, the platform spec. And this is similar to JCP, which comes in a second. So this is more like this, where you will find the older specs. So if you search here for uh, bin validation, you find a uh, bin validation. You will find the bin validation specs. And uh, this is what I usually are doing i'm downloading all the pdf in one folder and a full text search so there's great documentation still and even if some you know some apis are older they are still somehow up to date because uh it's not like you no know, the jakarta e moves like fast like crazy Mo most of the apis are still up to date and current yeah and you no know, there is no need you know to to rewrite dependency injection every two days so this is um, the difference or from my perspective the main difference between jakarta and microprofile because in microprofile the, there is actually a need to rewrite matrix every few months because the entire cloud native space moves requires that because there is you know changes from outside the java community uh, community okay jcp is similar to uh, MDN, so we had the guides, and what I did, I compiled actually resources. This and all the posts from, let's see, NSC quite popular, seven thousand hits. This is from November two thousand and nineteen. So this is a, a collection of links to all, uh, to all the the uh, tutorials, and uh, the same is true for Jakarta e links and resources. So where I, um, this is I think older. Yes, from September 2019. 
So there is a list of uh, of, of specs, and um, so still, what I showed you right now is now is the uh, is the guides and documentation from different angles from the runtime providers, but everyone implements the same specs. So actually, you can download a spec from whenever you like. And the guides is like different examples from different vendors. So this is a uh, different. Actually, you have the same in the web, right? So MDN is the spec. And then you had, you know, Chrome tutorials and Firefox tutorials and uh, probably uh, Microsoft Edge tutorials. Okay. So um, I think this are the. Um, oh, by the way, uh, about standards. Uh, um, there is going to be a, uh, a another Airhex live event about uh, web components in, in July. So it's almost around the corner. In a few weeks, this will be the next one. And then after this, I will still will do backend again. But this one is just about how to build productively uh, front end stuff with not, without frameworks. But I mean, productively means really, you know, uh, comp compared experience to frameworks without frameworks. This is actually the point of the entire workshop. So we did it once already on the M Munich airport before, you know, uh, the, the craziness, and now we do it online again. So if you like to attend, I think there's already um, enough registrations, but it would be nice if you also use, you know, uh, a video camera. The last uh, AIX live event about Quarkus and MicroProfile was a really nice experience. So there were people from all around the wor world, you know, with cameras with different time zones so i think i really enjoyed the enjoy the time so it was a nice event even for me as a uh, trainer or how to call it virtual assistant <laughs> your virtual assistant exactly so um okay cool um let's see what's that ah jakarta tutorial <laughs> forgot about that so there, there is a jakarta tutorial around the corner uh, this is uh, authored with uh, ASCII doc, so uh, it's interesting. So you can also take a look and on that. So I hope we covered your question, and then there was a lack, you know, a lack of uh, content. So um, I took the to, uh, opportunity and uh, just you know searched through my unanswered YouTube comments, which are a lot, and will answer them here at once, and you know so just submit the links and save a ton of time. So. Fortunately or unfortunately for me, uh, the community woke up and 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 wrote another, uh, added some questions uh, again. So so now we have no, a uh, lots of questions this time. So let's go quickly through this. Um. So uh, this was me. Opinion about mapping Java records to JSON naming conventions and and this is actually an interesting read. So if you if you go here to the let's see, I hope there is no autoplay. Let's say. Forgot to check that. Perfect. No autoplay. And the question is uh, regarding mapping JSON structures to PoJR. By the way, this was a joke for me. Plain old Java records, right? Because, and, and and why it's joke? Because Java records are fairly new, so they, they cannot be old. So I just used no coined a new term, hopefully. And but and this is an interesting article. And what the um, article says here is. Uh, let's say, um, what about that? So in JSON, we have created underscore at, and in Java, we have created camel case. So is this mapping, automatic mapping, good or bad? And um, and uh, what's my opinion on that? And I have to say, I I, I, I have, I, I had thought about this um, a lot already before actually you asked the question here. And now I say, okay, this is absolutely right. So in the last, Airhex IO tutorial, tutorial, web components with Redux and lit HTML. I had already, there was no Java involved, but I had JSON and I had a JavaScript object. And I thought, you know, should we use camel case, underscores, how to map, you know, one to one. And this is a great point in the article. So, um, so uh, what you should do? Should we, you know, rely on conventions where underscore becomes camel case? Is it a good thing or not? And you can achieve that with JSON B. And the problem of, with that is, of course, if you if you do this uh, that way, so that we rely on automatic conversion, not convention, convention plus conversion. So the problem is, you know, what about searching? So if I search created at, I will never find created underscore at. And this is very true. 
And I think it is more pragmatic to go with one convention. I already started with it without thinking about that. And I use camel case whenever possible. And I had the same you know, thoughts in YAML <laughs> with Kubernetes, which, which you know convention to choose. And I think the best approach for us Java developers would be just to use camel case, what you usually use in Java, you know, and 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 uh, just use you know the camel case in JSON, YAML, and everywhere else. So we have one consistent approach. But this is an interesting and actually short read. This article. So if you have some time, time uh, read it. This is older one from Jesse Wilson, but um, it's a nice one. So okay. Now, uh, next one. Someone, you know, the, the funny thing is, if I use Visual Studio Code, I get, you know, questions. Why are you not using uh, NetBeans? If I use NetBeans, someone asks me, you know, why are you using NetBeans in 2020? And the question is why I'm using NetBeans is because it is uh, convenient and very productive for me. And uh, NetBeans even comes with uh, nice ES6 support. So sometimes I spend some time, you know, uh, um, I've, I prefer for JavaScript Visual Studio Code, but um, uh, recently I just you know used NetBeans for for the web project and forgot actually I'm in NetBeans, so it was a nice one. And um, so and uh, for larger projects right now I'm, I'm I'm writing an application for for myself and uh, for backend um, and uh, and larger project and um, I use NetBeans and uh, for smaller project I tend to use Visual Studio Code. Because usually, you know, I try things out and I can open Visual Studio Code with code minus n dot. And it just opens in the folder, which is um, uh, is not as easy with NetBeans because usually NetBeans, you open NetBeans first and then you have to switch to folder. So this may be probably the distinction. In NetBeans, I have already prepared workspaces where I can switch between the workspaces. And Visual Studio Code, I use more for experimentation where I just, you know, open... Have, um, the editor in in folder and just start hacking. So there's a different you know approach. Yeah, and um, still I, I as I think I will still use you know NetBeans in 2021 as well. Now the next one increasing code coverage. Uh, so I should be careful about that. So because what I did once is the following. So this is increasing code coverage metrics without testing trivial methods. And you see the smiley. And this was uh, before April, and I should do it on the April first. And, but I got a lot of heat because it was the only screen cars, which is actually a joke. And what I, why I did it, uh, or what I did in this uh, in this uh, video, it's the following. So um, I, I found that you no know, lots of project I performed some code reviews, and I, what I found out is that in, in in a lot of projects, developers just you know wrote a unit test just to increase code coverage. I didn't care actually about that much about testing and more about numbers. So I got the idea actually, if you really care just about numbers, why not just you know, manipulate the statistics and save time? <laughs> so this was the idea. And what I did in the screencast is, I uh, manipulated CSS directly, I think, CSS. So without, you know, so that in the dashboard, you will see 100% code coverage without any, any unit test. And uh, the cool stories I got even, I think in the comment, you will find someone asked me, okay, um, it works, but if they reload the browser, the, you know the, how to persist the changes, which was a joke. And recently, I got a comment from, huh, where is there was a pinned comment, and someone said I'm programming beginner, or or was it already deleted? There was sort by newest first, yeah. Eugene said I'm still learning the program, and at uh, this was. Such a nice tip to learn. Going to implement it for my next project. Thanks. And what I what I wanted to tell you, uh, I say, okay, um, don't take it seriously. You know, this is this is a joke. This video. So if you are if you are if you are learning to go to code, I think unit tests can be useful. So don't manipulate the statistics. So this was just a, like you know a warning. Okay. Nice. Then the next one. So um, the next one is. What's the point of Java records? Um, someone else at YouTube said, "Okay, we have the you know, uh, Java records, but you know who cares?" And uh, you just write a little bit less code. And from from my perspective, it is um, a Java record. You just write basically. It looks like just a constructor without body, and you get uh, private fields, uh, getter accessors, uh, two string methods, um, and some reflection goodness for free. 
which is a lot. And what you could already do, you could, you know, uh, read with JPA a table and generate Java records on the fly, and uh, which would save you a tons of code. So for me, for productivity and maintainability, it's really, really good. And, um, and so you don't have you know, to use uh, crazy code generators to achieve the same. So I, I really like the Java records. If you don't know what Java records are, uh, take a look on my recent uh, YouTube uh, channel. So I created, I think, two or three videos about Java records. And one, I combined Java record with Jason P with Apache Johnson. I think it's Johnson. Yeah, John or with Z. Yeah. So um, the next one, also from YouTube, and um, and this is from the video securing Jaxorus endpoints with JWT. And this time, um, someone asked me, is it possible to use the same microprofile J J JWT auth code with microprofile config properties configuration to run it on different servers like Whitefly, Quarkus, Open Liberty, and Thorntail? And um, and Pyara, you forgot to mention. And the answer is, is absolutely possible. I do it actually all the time. The only difference is how the public or where what the servers are doing differently is is the configuration where the public key is fetched or stored. So there are different possibilities. And uh, Quarkus uh, usually uses application dot properties. And uh, I uh, I think right now it supports both microprofile configured properties and application properties. And, but uh, um, the the code, not the configuration, is actually the same. And microprofile config is all, also the same. You know the the uh, the standardized stuff. But um, there are minor change, minor differences. Like you know, the uh, Payara requires you to specify uh, I think login M MP JWT, and this is uh, absolutely not necessary if ignored on Quarkus. So there are min minor changes, but. Uh, 99% of the configuration is identical. So the next one is interesting comment, and I show you this because I thought about this a lot, and I try now to see what it is. And this is uh, from uh, so Mister here, and say, okay, um, back then I was a kind of a guru, and right now I'm just write you know trivial content, and um, I tried. And I, and, I, and I thought about this. Is it really true? Because I, you know, I took a look at my books. Are really that sophisticated? I don't think you know the uh, the rethinking best practices ten years old book was that sophisticated. What I just did, I just uh, tried to show how simple software can be. And if someone asks a question, I usually uh, you know record a screencast, and this could be a trivial one or, or not. Uh, for instance, uh, the recent uh, "What Is" uh, series I just named you know a playlist. What is? Just to quickly, you know, three minutes. Just uh, if someone asks a question, just push a video three minutes long, and 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 that is. And um, and she said, okay, um, whether I probably you need viewers and likes. Um, so what I can tell you is, I really like viewers and I like likes, but need. I mean, I don't know. Um, this is a curious case. So um, I don't have any ads on my YouTube channel, and, and also not have any ads on my uh, blog. So the question is whether, um, what I'm curious, um, can you you still get ads or not? So the, if you have the impression that I earn money uh, money from the AirHacks TV or from the screencasts because of ads, it's not true. And of course, if I will get tons of traffic, I will like it because uh, who? why not? I mean, if I record something and people watch it, it's nice. But uh, what I like more is the interaction from and, and comments and feedback because I need it, you know, to verify my ideas for real world. This is a kind of what you're doing for me is more like not code review rather than ideas review, no? Um, so, and you say, um, but you lost your originals. So, and, and don't think this is true because if you search for something like, what I remember is uh, white less EJB. So if you go here, uh, Adam Beam. So let's search for that. And or simplest possible EJB. So let's go simplest. Oh, exactly. This is um, a blog post from exactly you know that time you you mentioned that. And if you take a look on that, this is for me absolutely trivial. It's uh, less than hello world. So um, 
lots from a, a lot from my blog post and I have you know the whole history and also the older screencasts were about trivial stuff but um, I tried to show you know you don't need sophisticated stuff you know to achieve uh, small things and also uh, if you go to YouTube you will see you know a lot of short videos and I, I try I spend a lot of time actually to keep them short so if um, I record it once and if it's too long I record it again to uh, to make to try to make it as short as possible I hate you know too long stuff so um and uh, so what it means is a short video cannot be really sophisticated but if you go to airhex.io airhex.io it is more sophisticated all the all the courses here but they are not independent episodes they build upon each other and usually i implement an entire app and this app is based on questions and comments from Airhex TV and projects and conferences. So it is uh, not really sophisticated, but at least it answers common questions. So this is my approach to things. So um, sorry if you don't like my content, but I think my content didn't, or this um, level of sophistication didn't change a lot in the last 15 years or something like this. Um, yeah, and if you go go to YouTube and look at the comments, some people say this is way too sophisticated. The others say, you know, this is too easy. It's really hard, you know, to hit the right spot. But I enjoy the stuff. And uh, if someone asks a question, I record a screencast and push it if it's doable. If it's uh, not doable because it's too complex, I think about this and maybe I uh, answer the question at TV or maybe I uh, I do an AHX live event or something like this. Okay. Now, Jason B versus J Google uh, JSON, and uh, someone asked the question on YouTube as well, so I forgot to add the link. But um, and uh, the, the but this recent you know uh, comments from my YouTube channel, and um, so what's the question? What's the difference? And the main difference is JSON B is just an API. There is uh, there are multiple implementations, and JSON is just an implementation without the API. By the way, very similar to JSON B. So what it means is if you, you your application, let's say, uses JSON, and for other reasons, the runtime also uses JSON. So uh, then you have to be careful. You will probably have to use exactly the same version as your runtime, or you have sophisticated class loader hierarchy to isolate that. But if you're using JSON B and your runtime implements JSON B, you actually don't care who implements the JSON B. And if you don't like the implementation, you could try to swap the runtime implementation. So this would be the approach. Okay, perfect. Next one. So to summarize, JSON is just a framework. JSON B is an API without an implementation first. So this is just a spec. So thank you. Someone is a, a big fan from my videos. I forgot actually to 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 add the names. And uh, I have a big problem to choose correct framework for Java. I have students which um, have course pro programming in Java. So it's, it looks like you are a professor or uh, at least a teacher. And uh, not sure whether uh, what to learn because I demonstrate only Spring Boot MVC plus Mustache. So plus Mustache is already nice. Uh, but a lot of opinions online that Spring Boot and server rendered templates is not a good idea in this HR slow. So um, I don't know about Spring Boot, but uh, server-side rendering is actually uh, so first slow. I, I cannot imagine Spring Boot is slow. I mean, Spring Boot is it is it is a servlet. It will be as fast as a servlet. And um, I have no experience with Spring Boot, but uh, it, I, I assume uh, behind the scenes there is Tomcat or Jetty, and there is a servlet, and servlet is just fast. So, um, so what means slow is probably because of the architecture. You are generating HTML, which travels to the browser, and then in browser is the question what you are doing there. So, if you would you know send some JavaScript to the browser as well, so you will have a server side rendering. You could sell it as server side rendering, and it will be even completely. Uh, how to call it, a hyped solution, hype compatible solution. So any su suggestions which stack to use to create full stack simple web application? So full stack simple web application, so what means simple? So simple means uh, probably, so the question is, do you need a database, probably or not? So for instance, in my current uh, project, which I built for myself, I just use flat files. I don't need a database for specific reasons. And um, so it is, somehow simple and uh, what I use um, I just uh, use micro profile right now uh, with uh, started with open liberty in Payara just to test two and then it could be Quarkus Halidon or whatever but I don't care I just started with micro profile so first um, I would actually say 
For me, a must would be at least to have MicroProfile or Jakarta EY. If you started, start with MicroProfile API or Jakarta E um, API, so um, what, what it means is you can swap very easy the runtimes later. But if you start, let's say, with Quarkus without MicroProfile, then you cannot swap Quarkus with, um, with uh, Helidon and even worse, if Quarkus get an update and they get a lot of updates every three months an update or even you know more frequently, the problem is it can even break in theory your code. But uh, using a micro profile or Jakarta E API, I think is a very good thing because you can upgrade, you know, the, the life cycle of micro profile and the life cycle of, of, of Quarkus are decoupled a little bit. So um, if there is an upgrade of micro profile, you know. Then you only have to migrate if, if uh, usually you don't have to do anything. But if you would like to use the new features, you are you update your application you know, to use the new features. And if 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 uh, you get you know um, iterations, Quarkus iterations, you would you will never recognize any changes because you're just relying on Jakarta, Jakarta, Jakarta API like CDI or MicroProfile. So I would say start with MicroProfile. If you need WebSockets, JPA, then Jakarta E, still a very good choice. And then uh, probably something like Quarkus and Helidon, you cannot have you know leaner, leaner runtime than this. And regarding frameworks, I would choose Open Liberty and a Spring Boot is could be everything or nothing. It's, just, it's not like Spring Boot implements a API. You can pick and choose whatever you like. So Spring Boot is more like, you, you could say, okay, we are using Java. So on the server, so what it means, it can be everything, right? And micro profile is more, you know, focused uh, decision. Say, so, okay, this is this are the the let's say, how uh, are twelve APIs and nothing else. So this is micro profile. And um, yeah, full stack and full stack for me would be um, first consequent decision and the same decision everywhere is not bad. So it means front end would be in my eyes is just no. Uh, Web standards like uh, ES Plus, also ES6, or um, 2000, uh, 2015 um, JavaScript with uh, CSS3 Plus and everything which is supported by all browsers, which means, of course, web components and custom elements. And what I do, so the front end is more or less you know, the, the content of the last course uh, web components with Redux and Lit HTML. You could use Lit HTML and uh, more sophisticated apps, Redux. And backend we already mentioned, so I would use Jaxores for uh, for uh, uh, and JSON B and JSON P. So in a second to do it a little bit um, about that, and um, and uh, CDI for dependency injection. And then the question is, do you need database then JPA? And this would be um, I think state of the art choice right now, or at least I see a lot of interest regarding uh, Quarkus and therefore as well MicroProfile because the f everyone would like to have Quarkus, right? And the next question is no, how to use the thing. So, okay, just use no MicroProfile and then it's just, you can, we are independent of Quarkus. Okay. And you see, the next question is, um, Someone asked me, you know, Visual Studio Code, my 101 level tutorial, how to set up Visual Studio Code. So first, there is a, uh, there is, there will be a uh, EHEX FM um, discussion around that, and this is going to be uh, the next, uh, the next episode about um, Visual Studio Code. And to start with Visual Studio Code, um, I would suggest to use um, the Red Hats or Microsoft uh, Java support. So this is the Java plugin for Visual Studio Code. And then you are basically set. You get from Maven to Java, all the support. There's only my one minor difference. So if you use, I think, this uh, Microsoft uh, plugin, you won't get the visual uh, JUnit uh, um, um, view in the Visual Studio Code, and uh, otherwise uh, you you will only see you know the the console outputs. But this is my setup in Visual Studio Code. So download JDK 11 plus, and uh, then uh, install the Java plugin or Java runtime from Red Hat or uh, from Microsoft. And I think Red Hat is not a bad idea because you would like to have probably Quarkus support as well, which is also great. So this is what I will suggest. Exactly, and this was the recent. Uh, uh, interesting podcast uh, with Bruno Borges from Microsoft and um, about YAML and at the end you know we spent a lot of time discussing uh, 
matrix, whether matrix makes sense or not. So it was, in, I, I hope, interesting discussion. So uh, Bruno is always an interesting uh, discussion uh, guest. So now the next one path over path. So this was um, an article and uh, path off should be preferred over path get. The question is why? So I wrote an article or a post about uh, working there, how to you know uh, find a file uh, or from from uh, the the working uh, directory and this is this is the entire trick with the empty there. And um, and then I actually already recognized that uh, using path get uh, sorry, path off may be a better idea. The question is why. And for this purpose, of course, I will open NetBeans. And if you see this uh, path get, you see this is public static method. And the class is going, uh, the, the name of the final class is path. And if you go to the path, you see that this is actually an interface, which means a more modern approach. And the uh, path of you see this is was introduced with JDK 11 and there are lots of utilities methods or what could indicate that in the future releases Java 14 15 20 this might might become you know the standard and this uh, path uh, path get you see there is only two methods in this entire class private constructor which is already ugly and there are public static path get and public static path get, and uh, this is older JDK 1.7, and a JDK 11 in the path uh, interface, like utility interface, we got with JDK 11, this method, which would indicate in one point of time, properly this entire class becomes deprecated. So this was an interesting finding in my blog post. Okay. So, we cover that and then um, the next one and uh, first about uh, the so I didn't mention a lot the spring versus Jakarta E but in the recent airhex FM so let's see airhex airhex FM discussion with John Klingen and uh, uh, I have the discussion with John Kling Klingen for I think the last five years at least. So um, John is the PM product manager from uh, Quarkus and also I, uh, is, cares about MicroProfile a lot. So this was the last uh, one of the recent episodes of Airhex FM. And he said, okay, no clients ask us, you know, to to have uh, reduced RAM consumption. This was the problem. So okay, from, from my perspective, it shouldn't be a problem at all because a larger project can afford RAM. It's not like a RAM is crazy expensive. And he mentioned several times, you know, some Red Hat Summit sessions about how Spring Boot was migrated to Quarkus just to save memory. So this was the discussion about that because in my recent Twitter, Twitter uh, interactions, so you see the, uh, there was a lot of discussion about, about RAM consumption somewhere. You should follow the uh, Mr. V or follow follow the thread from Mr. Veruku, and also here Abel uh, Romero says, uh, you know, memory again. So this was the um, one of the reasons is to use memory. So yeah, to lose less memory, and um, and then someone also says how it's possible uh, whether Quarkus uses compression because I mean it is not possible to be to be smaller than Spring Boot and, and Quarkus do doesn't use any compression. What Quarkus just does, it optimizes everything at build time and at runtime, there is no dynamic behavior. So what in fact means is that a Quarkus, uh, I, I would say a simplistic Quarkus applications with all the micro profile included is actually smaller than empty Jetty or, or Tomcat, so which is remarkable. So, um, so you can save memory with Quarkus, but um, Importance of API. So in one project, this was actually a curious case because a client hired me to review a Jakarta E or Java E projects and I got a source code to look at this and this was a Spring Boot project. I said, okay, who cares? So then I will review a Spring Boot project. And um, I said, okay. Uh, and then there was you no know, the review day. I was a little bit nervous because I usually there are a view, you no know, things which I 
and a few findings, and uh, I presented the findings, which uh, was a little bit criticism, but overall, the quality of the project was really good. So it was uh, to the point, no overengineering. It was. It looked like you know uh, uh, a thin wall project with fat jars. Let's say, put this way, and um, and yeah, my client was amazed and they say, look, uh, we will still migrate it. We, we will migrate the project back to Jakarta E. And I say, why this? I mean, this was um, this was not this is actually not my recommendation. And it turned out that uh, it was a spring a one one and a half year I think old Spring Boot project, which was based on Spring Boot as I remember one for something, and now uh, the, the outside there is a Spring Boot two zero. And it turned out they use lots of uh, direct frameworks without uh, uh, going through the API. It just you know they used the framework directly. And if they will migrate to Spring 2.0, they had to migrate twice. So the first time to Spring, I think 1.5, and then from 1.5 to 2, and they told me this is too much, because uh, with the Spring Boot migration, it's not only the Spring Boot migration. What I understood. All the frameworks used are are tied to the Spring Boot framework, and they will have to rewrite the code, you know, to 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 use the recent version of the frameworks. And I never saw this this way. I just say, okay, Spring is just you can just pick and choose whatever you like. But of course, if you do this, there is no API. And uh, so I think having an API is really nice because it never happened to me in all the Java years. Where uh, we just no no mig had to migrate a server up and you say it is not possible because the entire app has to be rewritten. It was we had of course were always bugs, minor things, even in some cases you know memory leaks. Everything happened, but it was not like we were forced to rewrite the entire API. So and th therefore I think uh, this this API micro profile of Jakarta E is very nice. And now forget Spring Boot is also nice if you know choose to use uh, Helidon or Quarkus, I would prefer MicroProfile and Jakarta E over proprietary Helidon or, or Quarkus APIs for that reasons. So uh, Mr. Jamali asked me, I wonder why people consider to use React.js or Angular while they can use JSF or Vue.js functions to have server-side and client-side rendering plus lots of validation and so forth. You're absolutely right. In some startups, we just use JSF. And, and we are happy. The problem with JSF, of course, is you cannot be as pixel perfect because the whole point of JSF is you can use prime faces, which are ready to use components, and you're happy with the components, you are crazy productive. So nothing wrong with it. But um, if I build the front end by myself, I'm completely flexible. I'm, of course, a little bit slower or a lot slower than ready to use. No, not, not that slower because I can still use web components from prime faces or, or from SAP UI5 or a lightning web component, so it will be similar experience actually. So nothing wrong with your approach. The problem is uh, if uh, you know, everyone will bash on JSF, in one point of time, you know, uh, the prime faces guys uh, uh, will say, okay, now there is uh, pointless to use prime face, uh, to, to you know, deliver prime faces, we just focus on web components and then it, they will disappear. So Basama Basama Joe said, um, I'm posting from the 17 Bundesland, uh, probably Mallorca, I think. I followed you many years. Thank you and congr congratulate uh, to your great work you are doing. So this also think um, I have fun. So great work would be really, you know, to have structured work, what I do for you, you know, with some, it's just, I'm just talking and prepared a little bit, but it's not, yeah. But if you like it, I'm glad. Um, he um, he. I recently took your interesting course web components and Redux. This is the uh, first of AHEX.io, and I got a uh, good understanding what Redux is. Yeah, this is very simple. Simple is just singleton with a function, right? <laughs> My question is, I'm ready to how to sync the browser local data with database. Okay, what I did in the workshop, I did something unusual. It's like we don't need the backend. We did complete offline app, and I uh, uh, maintained the state of the Redux in a local store, and it worked perfectly. What I what I what I didn't did, I didn't communicate it with the backend because I th thought just we do it all the time, so just forget about that. But um, what how to do that, and uh, could you having a code example? I could even you know provide a bonus video about that. So um, in one point of time, in this particular case, I wrote an events application, which actually what this events ap application does is. Uh, in a second, the event application 
does the output is let's where is my out oh it's exactly that so this is the output of the events application so i can quickly type in you know the next online events and then uh, it will create in a shadow dom the uh, preview of the html and i just copy and paste to my block and i'm set so uh, i can s save some time and what i could what i did everything is stored in a local storage and is not synced with the server at all because i don't need it but what i could do of course, on every save button or on every change, I can send a patch event to the server or you can uh, introduce a save button and then save the entire state of the application to the server. So uh, I did something similar in my invoicing app I wrote for myself. So on every uh, change in the, in the front end, I send the entire state of the Redux store to the server. Works perfectly. Okay. Okay, so I will, if there is some time, I would create a small example and I'm working on a backend workshop right now, so you get more examples about that. Okay, so now I got from you, from, from Twitter, a really nice, uh, a really nice, let's go here, a tweet. Um, so I'm still slightly confused, uh, oh, it's still, it's still slightly confusing to have JSON P and JSON B. This is this. Maybe it can be merged, or maybe it can be a little bit clearer which one is used for what. I think most, if you're using JSON B, uh, JSON P is also used behind the scenes. And I think the main difference is in JSON P, for instance, in the invoicing application I mentioned right now, I'm using JSON P. Why that? Because um, if I send, I'm not interested in the contents, uh, I just write uh, whatever comes from, from the front end to the backend and is stored in a file and I don't care what it actually is. And uh, new invoices can have more attributes than the older ones. And I just pick uh, one or two attributes from the JSON stream, like I think the date to order the invoices. And uh, for search, I search, you know, for specific attributes. Way more convenient to use JSON P. And JSON B, I'm use, I will use in my, in, in um, the next project, what I'm, what I'm, what I'm, writing right now is a small block application for myself and um, then I was JSON B because I already have you know the post as an entity so it's easier not to say go post is you know the title the name and whatever so I think you need both if the data is more fl flexible you need something like more like a hash map which is actual or map which is JSON P and if you have uh, if you're thinking in objects you will use JSON B so we will need both and merging them I don't think so. It's more like, you know, should JDBC and JPA be merged? JPA uses JDBC. JDBC is more like a hash map, let's say, a table from a hash map view perspective, and JPA is more like Pojo. Okay, cool. I think we covered everything, and we have to stop. It's one of the longest episodes this year. Oh, and then a glitch cube. This is the 26 minutes ago during the show, asking a question. It was very good. And the project I'm working on, on now we don't have any automation for checking that our Maven or NPM dependencies have security vulnerabilities. I suggest Snick here from Google, but they wanted something that is cheaper. F oh, free? Any suggestions? Oh, free? I'm not sure. So there is a... Uh, recently there will be a podcast also about uh, the uh, security scanning, but there free I'm, I'm not sure about free security scanners so there is an pmd there is a find bugs but it's not about scanning it's more you know, searching in the at the um um searching um at, at the code level but a free scanning tool i'm not aware of a free scanning fortify some of my clients using but this is not really free um yeah so, and uh, also funny story, in uh, one project they used FET jars and because of security scanning they couldn't pass the FET jars and they swapped to thin wars and because there was separation uh, we passed the security scanning because we don't ha we didn't have you know, to rescan the server all over the time, uh, every time, just uh, on new releases and the same is true for Quarkus and for Helidon. So, um, Thank you for watching, I would say, and see you at upcoming conferences and, um, yeah, workshops, AHEX Live in July and uh, I think in July as well with the 76th edition of AHEX TV. So thank you and bye.